Those of you that have your Bibles with you in the sanctuary this morning, I'm going to take us to a familiar passage of Scripture, but we're going to go on a journey together. If the Lord would help us this morning, Exodus chapter number 15, Exodus chapter number 15, uh, if you would. I want to share with you, we're entering into the Thanksgiving season, and uh, how many knows we have a lot to be thankful for? And uh, I am optimistic of many things. I'm optimistic for what God is doing and God is continuing to do, and I think sometimes we lose sight of just how good God is. Uh, and I, I want us to maybe pause and just reflect and remember today uh, just on the goodness of God and, and the faithfulness of God. And, uh, but that being said, I think all of us in this room would, would say this uh, in concert today, and that is this, that we do love our nation. Uh, we love our country. We love the men and women that have served and fought for its freedom. And, uh, and we, we're a patriotic people. We're a people that is very thankful and grateful for the sacrifices that's been made. And sometimes the lines get blurred, I believe, uh, when we begin to try to successfully distinguish uh, who we are as the church as well as being patriots for our nation. And it's not just this nation, but people in other parts of the world, they love their nation as well, and I can appreciate that very much so. But I stand here today with great concern of where I see uh, our nation, as many of you do, if not all of you, as well as I stand here today with great concern of where I see the church, uh, as many of you do as well. Now, I believe that we can safely say that there is a remnant, uh, the church. God always has had a church, and he will have a church. And that remnant is very healthy today. Uh, it's without spot. It's without blemish. Uh, it's walking with the power and the anointing of the Lord, as it always has. Uh, but that isn't what the world sees when they see the church. They basically see the church world as we know it today, not necessarily the remnant. If you talk to people in the Middle East, basically they believe, especially in Muslim culture, they believe that everybody in the West is a Christian. So therefore, with that understanding, what they see in the West is really a very blurred vision of what a Christian truly is. But to drive my point home before I get into our text this morning, because if the Lord would help me, I want to preach to you this morning for a thing on, on this thought of Thanksgiving praise. But it wasn't all that many years ago that uh, at the founding of our nation and the constructing of our nation, one of the most uh, amazing places uh, for me, one of the places that I love to visit the most, and it's not to visit the politicians, but it is just to visit uh, our nation's capital. Uh, um, Washington, D.C. is one of, the, one of my most favorite places to go. If I go, uh, you will find me early in the morning. You'll find me in the wee hours of the morning, late, late hours of night, walking the National Mall, uh, just praying and reflecting on many things and taking in the scenery there. But if you understand the history of the design of the National Mall, you will find that it is in the makings of a cross. And every morning, uh, there is a specific place that the sun hits before it hits any other building in the District of Columbia. And it was designed specifically that way. At the top of the Washington Monument, uh, on the east side, on the very cone of it, there's a couple of Latin words there that was strategically placed there and our founding fathers, as well as the designers of that particular monument, they purposely positioned those words there so that the sun would hit on that before it hit anything else in that area. And those words translated as simply this, praise be to our God. Think about that. Every day in our capital, 
uh, the sun shines on those words before it shines on anything else. Praise be to our God. Now, you say, why is that important today? Is because there was a time in our nation where we had a thanksgiving praise to our Creator. Today, we're far from that. But not only as a nation, unfortunately, we have to look at the church world in general. And we will say today that there used to be a time in the platforms of the American church that there would be a call that would simply say, praise be to our God. But now that is far gone from there too in many places. Because no longer is it reflecting on him and who he is but nothing more. We've cheapened this platform to become nothing more than a world stage for people to show off their talents and their giftings. I want to stand this morning and publicly ask the Lord to forgive us for that as a nation and as a church because this morning it's still about Jesus. And this morning there is, while I don't think we have to go backwards to go forward, I still believe that we have to come back to the Word of God to go forward. And this morning, I want to take you on a journey, uh, and I want to show you uh, the faithfulness of God and the blessings of God. If you're able, I'm going to ask you to stand for the reading of the Word, and we're going to dive in together. If you're not able, I totally understand, uh, but out of respect to the Word of the Lord, I do do ask that this morning. Exodus chapter number 5, I want to read the first 13 verses in your hearing, then I want to drop down and read verse 20 and 21 as well. It says, Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord, and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and song, and he has become my salvation. He is my God, and I will prepare him a habitation. My Father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host hath he cast into the sea. His chosen captains also are drowned in the Red Sea. The depths have covered them. They sank into the bottom as a stone. Thy right hand, O Lord, has become glorious in power. Thy right hand, O Lord, hath dashed in pieces the enemy. And in the greatness of thy excellency, thou hast overthrown them that rose up against thee. Thou sentest forth thy wrath, which consumeth them as stubble. And with the blast of thy nostrils, the waters were gathered together. The flood stood upright as a heap, and the depths were concealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My lust shall be satisfied upon them. I will draw my sword. My hand shall destroy them. Thou didst blow with thy wind. The sea covered them. They sank as lead in the mighty waters. Who is like unto thee, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like thee, glorious in holiness, fearful in praises, doing wonders? Thou stretched out thy right hand. The earth swallowed them. Thou in thy mercy hath led forth the people which thou hast redeemed. Thou hast guided them in thy strength unto thy holy habitation. Verse number 20. And Miriam the prophetess, the sister of Aaron, took a temporal in her hand, and all the women went out after her with temporals and with dances. And Miriam answered them, Sing ye to the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. The horse and his rider hath he thrown into the sea. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word this morning. I thank you for your people. I thank you for your faithfulness. I thank you for all that you are doing in this very present moment upon the earth. And Lord, today I ask that you would anoint this vessel of clay to speak your word. Help us to have ears to hear and hearts to receive. In Jesus' name, the church says, amen and amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord this morning. This is somewhat a familiar story probably for most in this room, if not all, but let me revisit part of it this morning with you. As we look at our text, we see the children of Israel have just went through a time of great emotion and great uncertainty. 
they had been living in a place of bondage. They had been under hard taskmasters. They had been under the authority of the Egyptians for many years at this point. And the land where they had been dwelling had just went through a very vigorous time. Most of us can relate and remember parts, if not all, of the 10 plagues that came upon the land of Egypt. You have to remember that if you go back to Exodus chapter number three and begin to move forward, you will find that there was a man on the backside of the desert whose name was Moses and he was there. And the Lord simply said, I want you to go stand before Pharaoh and I want you to command him to let my people go. He said, but I'm going to harden his heart and he's not going to do that, but we're going to go through a process. And there is many different ideals that have been presented that people think theologically uh, it determines why there was 10 plagues and how it dealt with different idol gods that was in the land and all of those things. We're not going to get into that today. But at the same time, I will tell you that when you begin to walk through this time in the land of Egypt, there was great unrest. There was great uncertainty. There was great difficulty. And then we find that there began to be a setting apart where in the beginning, everybody was experiencing what was happening in the land, uh, the just and the unjust, uh, those that was under bondmen uh, and those that was free. Uh, they was all experiencing the difficulty. The water was turning to blood. Uh, the frogs was everywhere. We could talk about all of the plagues. Uh, but then we find there come a time in the middle of this selective judgment that was upon the land of Egypt that God began to separate the children of Israel from the people of Egypt. And we find that they did not experience uh, some of the things that was happening in the land. But we find that as this process was going uh, in the land that they was dwelling, they saw these plagues up close and personal. Uh, but then when you get to the final one, we know this, that the Lord gave very clear instructions uh, to the man of God concerning the children of Israel. And he simply said this, uh, I want you to prepare yourself. I want you to dress in a certain way. I want you to take a lamb. I want you to uh, pre prepare it. I want you to take the, the blood and put it on the doorpost and the lintels of your home. Uh, and I don't want you to come out because there is going to be the destroyers going to come through the land. And those that are not covered by the blood that's in the house, those that are not covered, uh, the firstborn of every house, small and great, is going to be destroyed. And we know that that occurred. And we find that when that did happen, uh, the darkness gave way to light uh, amongst the children of Israel. Can you think with me this morning, just for a brief moment, of what it must have sounded like uh, in the land of Egypt at that time? Uh, in the wee hours of the morning, uh, in, the, in the dark cover of night, uh, all of a sudden the wailing of mommies and daddies that lost uh, the firstborn. Uh, and all of a sudden to look around and see uh, the firstborn of all of the cattle. Everything is death is everywhere. Uh, but we find that the children of Israel in the midst of this great darkness, uh, they began to see a glimmer of hope. They began to see a light begin to shine forth because we find uh, in Exodus chapter 12 uh, that the dark Darkness gave way to light when Pharaoh uh, called for the man of God. He called for Moses in chapter 12, verse number 30 through 33. It says, And Pharaoh rose up in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was not a house where there was not one dead. And he called for Moses and Aaron by night and said, Rise up and get you forth from among the people, both ye and your children of Israel, and go serve the Lord. Uh, also take your flocks and your herds uh, and be gone. Uh, and notice in the Egyptians, they were urgent upon the people that they might send them out of the land in haste to say, we will all be dead if you continue to stay here. Uh, so the, it, the children of Israel uh, went from being bondmen uh, to a place of freedom and wealth in one night. Uh, because if you read a little further in chapter number 12 and 35 and 36, uh, you will find where the Lord favored them uh, and they spoiled uh, the Egyptians. Uh, so therefore, when they left out, they left out full. They did not leave empty. Uh, we then see the Lord begin to speak instructions to Moses. Uh, as he begins to speak these instructions to him, we find that it says that he killed him. He said, I don't 
want to take them out of the way of the Philistines because I don't want them to see war, but we'll want to take them uh, out by the way of the sea. Uh, and then we find that as they was moving forward in chapter number 13 uh, and verse 21 through 22, we find that the Lord did not abandon them, but he took them and he said, I'm going to protect you. Uh, and he says this, and the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of a cloud uh, and at night in a pillar of fire. You know, most of you are familiar with that, uh, but the story does it in there. Uh, we see the Lord continue to have conversation with Moses. Uh, and he simply said, speak unto the children of Israel, turn in and camp by the sea in Exodus chapter 14, verses one through eight. Uh, and this was the purpose of it. Uh, he said, I will harden Pharaoh's heart uh, and he shall follow after you, uh, but he said, I will be honored upon Pharaoh uh, and upon all his host uh, that the Egyptians may know that I am the Lord. Uh, listen uh, to me this morning, please. Uh, the Lord said this, I am making a day in the very near future. Uh, come, uh, there is a moment in history uh, that's getting ready to take place uh, where the Egyptians are going to know that I am the Lord. Uh, can I say to you this morning, uh, there is so many parallels with that time in history uh, than where we are right now. Uh, I believe that I safely can say biblically uh, that here in the United States of America, as well as other nations, uh, there is a day that is coming uh, where there is going to be a proclamation uh, that has been orchestrated supernaturally uh, by the hand of God uh, and that there is Egyptians, uh, meaning this, the world system uh, is going to make a proclamation uh, where they have to concede uh, that there is one true God. Uh, even though they don't want to acknowledge it, uh, that there is a day that's coming. Uh, and can I tell you, uh, in that day, uh, God is going to walk and emerge in victory and in power and authority. Uh, and he's going to show himself mightily, uh, not by the angelic host of heaven, uh, but by the vehicle that he is the head of uh, called the church. Uh, so can I tell you this morning, uh, you and I do not have to be full of fear and anxiousness, uh, but you and I today can stand with great confidence uh, and know this, uh, that no matter what goes on around us, uh, we the church uh, are going to continue to move forward uh, and we are going to flourish uh, and we are going to experience the goodness of God and the grace of God uh, and therefore we ought to go ahead and begin to give him praise uh, and thanksgiving uh, for who he is. You say, how, do you, how can you say that, Pastor? Notice with me, uh, there is a very prophetic statement uh, in the book of Proverbs. Uh, now, I know most people don't think that Proverbs is a prophetic book, uh, but in Proverbs chapter number four, verse number 18, notice what it says. Uh, but the path of the just uh, is as the shining light uh, that shineth more and more unto the perfect day. What Solomon is writing is this, no matter how dark the world gets, the church, the upright, the just is on a path that's going to intensify. It's going to become, as we find in other scripture, the church is going to continue to move from glory to glory to glory. No dark thing can exalt itself against the church. That's why Jesus said to his disciples, Especially Peter, when he asked him, who do men say that I am? Peter said, thou art Christ, the son of the living God. And he simply said, flesh and bone has not revealed this to you, but there's a revelation of God that's come to you. And he said, upon this, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What he's saying is this, the just is going to be in a place where there is nothing that can destroy them. Now, please hear me. Let me stay on track this morning. We find that the, he said there's the Egyptians are going to know that I am the Lord. And if you read on, we find what happens. Pharaoh's heart was hardened. He picks out 600 chosen chariots and all of the chariots of Egypt and the captains over every one of them. And they began to pursue. Now in chapter 14, verse number 10, when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel lifted up their eyes and they saw the Egyptians march after them. And it says, and they were sore afraid. And the children of Israel began to cry out to God. 
In this moment of time in history, it looked impossible for the children of Israel to advance any further. They had a reason to be concerned. They had a reason to be uptight. Their leader has brought them to the edge of the Red Sea. They're not able to go forward. And then they see the dust clouds of the enemy. 600 chosen chariots with all of the other chariots and the mighty men. And all of a sudden they begin to cry out to God because in the natural it looked like it was coming to a close. But I have to remind you, it was not a normal time. And it wasn't a normal time because the Lord had already spoken to Moses, as I just shared with you a moment ago, and said, I will harden the heart of Pharaoh, and he's going to pursue after you. But there's a purpose. There's a plan. I am going to let the Egyptians know that I am the Lord. Now, if you read on in Acts 14, 13 through 22, you will find that then Moses stands before the people and he says this, fear not, stand still, and see the salvation of the Lord, which he will show you today. For the sake of time, I'm not going to read the rest of it, but I'd encourage you to do so. But you find that you need this, and then when you begin to read this story, you find that the word of the Lord tells Moses to stretch out his rod. And as he stretched out the rod, we know this, that the waters began to part and the cloud and the pillar of fire moved from above and forward and moved to the back and it separated the children of Israel from Pharaoh's army and they passed all night long on dry ground is what your Bible says. And then notice what happens. The Egyptians' heart was so hardened that they began to pursue after them in verses 23 through 28. And as they began to pursue after them, we find this, that the Lord began to trouble the Egyptians. I don't know how he did it. Other than this, I know that he did do it. He began to trouble them in such a manner that he made the wheels come off their chariots. Now, as those wheels began to come off the chariots... They drove those chariots hard into the ground and all of a sudden the man of God was said to, was instructed to raise his rod again and the water came over and drowned the Egyptians. Which brings me back to our text this morning. Then sang Moses and the children of Israel. And Miriam picked up her tambourine and the other ladies began to dance behind her and she turned and noticed what she said. She said, Sing ye to the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously. What she's saying is this. He beautifully, brilliantly, gain victory over our enemy. Can I tell you this morning, I has have this notion in my innermost being that God is getting ready to beautifully and brilliantly gain victory in this hour. We today need to understand that it isn't about us having every piece of knowledge. We just need to have his word of truth and it be revealed to us in the stages that he sees fit. And we walk it out by faith. Notice, I must remind you today that we too still have a reason to sing. The children of Israel found themselves in an untimely, unplanned situation when all of a sudden it looked like everything was over. Then they taste a little bit of victory and then it looks like everything is crumbling down again. 
But then they see this massive display of God's power and they began to sing and dance and they began to be glorious in the presence of their God. Can I remind you this morning that while life takes its toll on all of us and while the day-to-day things that we get involved with begins to cloud our vision of what really is important at times. I have to remind you this morning that it appeared to the enemy in that moment uh, that God was doing something supernaturally that could not be explained. And when we pause and look right now of what's taking place in our world, uh, we have to pause and say, you know what? God is really up to something because it can't be explained. Uh, But this morning, I have to tell you uh, that there is still an empty tomb. As Pastor Jade mentioned this morning, uh, there is still an empty tomb in Jerusalem. Jerusalem, uh, and therefore we still have a reason uh, to offer a thanksgiving praise. Uh, I know that life has issues in it. Uh, I know that there's difficulties in our lives, uh, but can I tell you, uh, you have been saved. Uh, you have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. Uh, you are no longer uh, somebody that's separated, uh, but you are somebody that has the awesome privilege uh, to go beyond the veil uh, that was rent a little better than 2,000 years ago. Uh, and today, you and I have the ability uh, to sit in the presence of God, uh, to dwell in the presence of God. Uh, He not only has saved us uh, for all eternity, uh, but he has delivered us. Uh, He has bought uh, our healing. Uh, He has bought uh, our protection. Uh, Listen this morning, please. Uh, Do not allow the world to take away the praise uh, that we are to have and to possess. uh, Because can I tell you, we may be facing uncertain times in this hour, uh, but one thing that is certain is this, uh, that you have been bought by a price uh, and you have been brought out of your Egypt uh, and he didn't bring you out of Egypt to leave you at a Red Sea, uh, but he brought you to a Red Sea uh, so that he could show you his marvelous glory and power in your life. There is a stretching out of the rod over things, I believe, in this hour, much like then. Uh, And can I tell you, I will prophetically stand here and tell you this morning that there is a wind that is returning uh, to the United States of America. Yes, it's going to continue to get dark. Uh, Yes, there's going to continue to be opposition. Uh, But there is a wind that's coming back to the blood-bought saints of God. Uh, We are not going to go down in a weakened state, uh, but we're about to receive uh, a fresh infusion uh, of the power and the anointing of the power of God. Uh, Listen, uh, we're about to get into the more of God uh, because uh, of the simple fact of where we are. But I have to ask you this morning, where is your praise? I'm trying to hurry this morning. Can I quickly remind you why Jesus came today? You say, but preacher, you don't know, man, my life is crazy. Listen, all of us have a story. All of us have struggles. All of us has opposition. But we cannot focus on the challenges. We have to focus on the promises. Amen. The first thing that I want to remind you of this morning is this, that Jesus came so that he could call sinners. Mark chapter 2, verse number 17 says, When Jesus heard it, he saith unto them, They that are whole have no need of the physician, but they that are sick, I come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. I'm thankful this morning that he come to call sinners. Because I have to stop and remember today, I was one of them. I was lost. I was dying. I was on my way to hell. But God. You say, I I just don't feel like I have much to praise him for today. Can I tell you? When you began to bring it into perspective that I was a sinner and now I'm saved by the grace of God, you've got a reason to have a praise upon your lips this morning. So why in the world are you letting the enemy take away your victory, take away your praise? Can I tell you, there was a time when the rafters of the church would ring, not because the praise team was singing, but because the body of Christ began to sing and lift up its voice out of thanksgiving. Can I tell you, we got to get back to a place where a thanksgiving praise is up on our lips continually. He's been good to you this morning. Has he been good to anybody? 
which means this, that he came for you and I. Do I have any former sinners in the house this morning that can say that's not who I am any longer? That man is dead. You know why he can testify that he's dead is because Jesus came. Secondly, this morning I give you this. Not only did he come to call sinners, but he came to serve and give his life. Mark chapter 10, verse number 4 to 5 says, For even the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. He laid down his life for you. There's a lot of people gave some stuff to you throughout your life, I'm sure. They're kind of like the chicken. They gave you a few eggs along the way. But if you've ever sat down and enjoyed a real nice piece of bacon, listen, he laid down his life for you. Think about it. I, I want you to understand that he came to lay down his life for a ransom for many. You and I are part of that many today. But when was the last time? Let's be honest and real and transparent this morning. When was the last time we just said, Lord, thank you for laying down your life for me so that I could live? See, a Thanksgiving praise is not something that should be occasionally given, but it should be continually given. He also come to proclaim the good news. Anybody thankful for the good news this morning? You see, Luke chapter 4, verse 18 and 19, it says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives and the recovering of the sight to the blind, to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. What does that really mean? It means that he came to set free from all things that try to enslave us. And therefore, I have to ask the question, has the good news delivered anybody in this room? Can anybody say that I once was blind, but now I see? Can anybody once say I was bruised by the things of this world, but now I'm healed? You see, sometimes we just got to bring it into perspective. Fourthly, I tell you this, he came that the world might be saved. John 3, 17 says, For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. What does that really mean this morning? Have we forgotten what it means to be able to stand and give the testimony that I thank God that I'm saved and on my way to heaven. Can anybody testify to that fact that your sins are under the blood this morning? Amen. But fifthly this, he came to do the will of his Father. John 6, 38 through 40 says, For I come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him that sent me. And this is the Father's will which has sent me, that of all which he hath given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up again at the last day. And this is the will of him that sent me, that every one which seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last day. Because he was willing to come and do the will of his Father, guess what? This morning, you and I that are covered by the blood of Jesus can stand and say what Paul said. O oh, death, where is thy sting? O oh, grave, where is thy victory? This morning, do you understand what it really means to identify as a child of God? Or have we lost our way in such a manner that we no longer truly grasp what it is? For too long, we have allowed the enemy to steal our joy and our praise. 
But let me remind you, and I'm, I'm hurrying this morning, in Isaiah chapter 61, very familiar. The first part of it is a repeated what we just read in Luke, but let me read verse number three of chapter 61. He says this in verse number two, to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all that mourn, to appoint unto them that mourn in Zion, to give unto them beauty for ashes, the oil of joy for mourning, the garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness, that they may be called trees of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he might be glorified. I don't know about you, but I think I'll just praise him one more day. It's time to once again, to not just offer praise, but to give a thanksgiving praise. Thankfulness is mentioned 71 times in New Testament scripture. Most commonly, it means to show oneself grateful or to express gratitude. We see all throughout scriptures where individuals expressed their thankfulness. One of them is in our text this morning, Miriam, when she realized what had happened, she grabbed her tambourine and began to dance and began to sing unto the Lord. We find that there was by the name of Hannah who had a barren womb, but she began to give thanks unto the Lord. We could look at David in 2 Samuel chapter 22, and he began to give thanks unto the Lord. We could begin to talk to you this morning about Solomon in 1 Kings chapter 8, where he began to give thanks unto the Lord. We could talk to you this morning about Elizabeth, uh, who her womb was barren until late in life, and then she brought forth John the Baptist uh, and late in life, and she was thankful that the Lord had not forgotten her. We could talk to you this morning about Mary, the mother of Jesus, who began to have a conversation and said, Lord, I'm thankful that you have shown graciously to me. We could talk to you about the leopards, uh, that when they began to walk and they began to see that they was cleansed, uh, and they began Began to give God thanks and praise. Uh, we could talk to you about the lady with the alabaster box uh, that began to pour out the oil upon the head and the feet of Jesus and began to wash his feet with her tears. Uh, but just to name a few, but today I want to really leave you with this. Uh, in Psalms 111, we find that the psalmist writes, praise you the Lord. I will praise the Lord with my whole heart in the assembly of the upright. Let me pause there. When was the last time we just had a radical time of thanksgiving praise in the house of the Lord as we gather together. We've lost our focus, friend. The works of the Lord are great, sought out of all of them that have pleasure therein. His work is honorable and glorious, and his righteousness endureth forever. He hath made his wonderful works to be remembered. The Lord is gracious and full of compassion. He hath given meat unto them that fear him. He will ever be mindful of his covenant. He has showed his people the power of his works that he may give them the heritage of the heathen. Which brings me to Psalms 100. Make a joyful noise unto the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with thanksgiving. Know ye that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise, but be thankful unto him and bless his name for the Lord is good, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth to all generations. I want to ask you this morning, does anybody in here understand that he is good. Anybody? Does anybody know that his mercy is everlasting? And does anybody remember that his truth endures to all generations? If his truth endures to all generations, it means his truth is now present. And his truth says that there is nothing uh, that can come nigh thy dwelling if you put your trust and faith in him. So why is it that we're battling such a spirit of fear and anxiety in the world today within the church? Uh, why is it today that if his mercy is everlasting, uh, we are standing on pins and needles? Uh, why is it today if the Lord is good, uh, are we so uptight about what we see naturally? Uh, if he is a good father still, uh, it means he's always going to protect his children. Uh, he's 
make provision for his children uh, and he's not going to leave you or abandon you. Uh, so therefore with those truths, uh, I can stand with a heart of thanksgiving and say, God, uh, you delivered me yesterday. I know you'll deliver me today. Uh, and if you give me tomorrow, I know that tomorrow is going to be a day where I'm blessed uh, and highly favored. Uh, why? Is because David said, surely uh, goodness and mercy uh, will follow me all the days of my life. Uh, listen, uh, I want to get you free this morning morning. Uh, I didn't come with a big message. Uh, I just come with the simple truths of God's word. Uh, that The reason that we're walking in the mully grubs uh, is because we have lost our praise. Uh, but when you begin to get your eyes on Jesus, uh, you cannot be somebody that's down. Uh, you cannot be somebody that's discouraged. Uh, but when I look to him, uh, I see goodness. Uh, I see mercy. Uh, I see protection. Uh, I see joy unspeakable. Uh, I see strength. Uh, I see the power and the mighty hand of God. Uh, how in the world can I be distraught this morning? Uh, I think I'll just praise him. Oh, but you don't know, preacher. I got to get 15 pies done. I got to get three cakes done. I got to get a turkey in the oven. Listen, all of those things are wonderful. Uh, but listen, uh, something better than that uh, is to know uh, that you're in the presence of Almighty God uh, and that he has never failed you this morning. A thanksgiving praise is something that cannot be substituted. This morning as we stand all over the house, I want to give you this verse and we're going to pray. Here's what I want you to understand. I never want you to forget this. I mentioned this verse in passing on Wednesday evening. But I want to revisit this morning. As they come to the piano this morning. Zephaniah chapter 3 verse number 17 makes a very clear statement. Here's the first thing that I want you to hear. The Lord thy God in the midst of thee is mighty. I want you to tell your neighbor, say he's a mighty God. I don't know if they believe you yet. Can you tell them one more time? He's a mighty God. How many knows if he's mighty that he's one that can bring victory? Amen. He's a mighty God. Now turn to your neighbor and tell them the rest of this verse, this next section. He will save. And I'm not talking just about salvation, but he will save. What does that really mean, Pastor? It means this. I'll never forget about this time of year it was Thanksgiving. Actually, I believe it was. Me and Debbie wasn't even married. I'll tell you how many years ago. It's a long time ago. I was a young man. On the other side of the bridge it wasn't doing anything it was nice but the bridge at Lawrenceburg on this side Indiana of course you never know what you get about one o'clock in the morning I'm bringing Debbie to meet my parents she's sleeping I'm driving and all of a sudden it was like a line in the sand it was nothing but ice on this side of the bridge I wasn't even serving the Lord. One o'clock in the morning, I'm running the speed limit plus some. <laughs> I come across that bridge, everything was fine, and I hit, I hit ice, and my little truck just begins to go like this all the way, just kept spinning. I wasn't even serving the Lord, and I simply said, Jesus, help me. Somehow, some way, because he's mighty. He took that little ranger, and he just spun it like a little hot wheel and set it straight back on the road. Never did he, he will save. Not only will he save, 
Please hear me. Not only will he save, but he will rejoice over you. Hear me. Think about it. I don't think you're going to get Queen Elizabeth to rejoice over you today. I don't think you'll get this current administration to rejoice over you today. Or any other previous administration to rejoice over you today. But there's a king of all kings. That when he looks down and he sees you. He sees the blood that you're covered in. He sees the proclamation that you've made to follow after him. He begins to rejoice over you with joy. And he will rest in his love. Think about it. He will joy over you with singing. I think this is so powerful. When you begin to dig into the fact that when we begin to offer up a thanksgiving praise unto the King of kings and Lord of lords and we do that by living a life that brings honor and glory to him in all areas of our life, when we begin to do that, it doesn't just affect this earthly realm, but it begins to affect the heavenlies. Isaiah chapter 6 says it this way. I saw the Lord high and lifted up in the year that King Uzziah died and his train filled the temple. He caught a glimpse and he saw the Sephrims and they were saying, holy, holy, holy. And they were seeking in such a loud manner, such a powerful manner that the doorposts began to shake in the temple. That's what he saw in the heavenlies. But when the people of God began to walk in thanksgiving and praise, He looks down from heaven and he takes joy over us and he begins to sing. I believe that when people begin to walk in places of praise and thanksgiving, that it alters the things of heaven in such a way that the Sephrims have to kind of quit saying holy, holy, holy because they begin to listen to his voice and he's beginning to sing. Think about it. Wonder what he's singing over us today. Wonder what he's proclaiming over you and I today. We are serving a good, good father this morning. Has he been good to anybody this week? Has he protected anybody this week? Has he went before you this week? Has he protected your family this week? Oh, has he made provision for you? Is there food on your table, clothes on your back? Where's our praise this morning? Listen, this is not about religious activity. This is not about religious duty. This is not about religious responsibility. But it's about coming unto the house of the Lord and saying, Oh God, I give you everything. A politician isn't going to save this nation. A political party won't save this nation. Revival will not come because a great message is preached or a great song is sung. Revival will come to this nation when the people in the house like this all across this land begins to once again say, God, I thank you. And when you begin to get your eyes on Jesus, he begins to sing over us. As he begins to sing over us, and he takes joy in us, we begin to witness his mighty hand. I wish I could take time to tell you everything that's in my spirit today. But can I tell you that there is a major shift spiritually. There's some things that's been pursuing. I've preached this since 2015. But we're getting ready to witness some chosen chariots lose their wheels 
and it's already happening. And they're grinding into the sand. But the nostrils of God is getting ready to blow a fresh wind. And there's a recovering of the Holy Spirit getting ready to come. It's going to bring destruction to the wicked, but it's going to propel the righteous. This morning during worship, I looked out the window of that door and the snow was falling. And I heard the Lord say in my spirit vividly, clearly and loudly. He said, fall tells you that things is dying. But he said, I'm telling you with this snowfall this morning that I'm purifying so that it can live again like it's never lived. This morning, somebody needs to begin to praise him. The rest of this year needs to be a thanksgiving praise in your house, in your workplace, in the house of worship. I'm not making light of the struggle, but I'm telling you, you got a mighty God. And when you begin to praise him, he begins to make proclamation. He doesn't just sing a song. He sings a prophetic song. And when he makes a proclamation, life begins to enter in. And can I tell you, as we transition into 2022, there is a wind of refreshing and renewal coming to the body of Christ. And we're getting ready to hear Miriam's tambourine. And we're getting ready to see a dancing of the church. There are those that's been bound and pursued for years. I stand here today and prophetically tell you, Egypt has been broken, the Red Sea is opening, and the shout of praise is returning. Hey everyone, it's Pastor Jade here. I want to thank you for watching today. I pray that this message spoke directly to you and challenged and transformed your life by the power of the Holy Ghost. And I want to invite you to connect with us on social media and stay up to date with what's happening here at PTC. I pray that you have a great week and a great year in the Lord. We love you.